السلام عليكم السلام عليكم السلام عليكم well good evening uh, we have a treat in store tonight we have with us two extraordinary individuals two remarkable public servants two great representatives of their own countries, but who've actually uh, have a vision of the region, and not just the region, but the world that extends well beyond the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the state of Israel. So I'm looking forward to this conversation, and I think it could hardly be more timely given the events in the region. So uh, to my immediate left is uh, His Royal Highness Prince Turkey Al Faisal, who served, as you saw in the program, as the head of intelligence for the kingdom, as well as the ambassador to the US, and who has come to visit us from time to time, but not often enough. Uh, we also have Dan Meridor, whom I'm especially proud to say has spent a month with us this time, uh, having come for a shorter period earlier and decided that it was, that we were friendly, okay? Uh, Dan, in his previous job, was the number two in the government of Israel, the deputy prime minister to Bibi Netanyahu, and also the chief civilian responsible for intelligence, and has had a very distinguished career there, but has also been a very good friend of the Belfer Center here at the Kennedy School and of Harvard. So for our discussion tonight, we're going to start with the Middle East, but we're going to go from there. Uh, and we're not quite sure, uh, since we're going to open to everybody in the room, questions uh, on almost any topic will be relevant because these two gentlemen not only think about their own countries and think about the region of the Middle East, but have views about the world. So uh, I would say uh, stay tuned. Okay? So if you didn't know uh, much, and we're just looking at the Middle East today, if we can take the first slide. Uh, uh, I guess probably the newspaper would say, is the Middle East burning? or maybe uh, less uh, politely, are things going to hell and how fast? So here I just noted uh, for you, for your geographically, uh, you've got wars or civil wars going on in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Libya, and even to some extent Egypt. There are nine million refugees from the Syrian conflict where more than 200,000 people have been killed. You have apparently irreconcilable differences between Iran and Saudi, extremes and moderates, Shiites and Sunnis. Uh, if we were looking at this, you'd say things seem to be getting worse. And as somebody said recently, they would expect they get worse before they get worse. So. Uh, you both come from the region. How do you see what's happening in this region today? Let me start with Prince Turkey. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Allison. This is a great privilege for me to address an audience as daunting as this. And also, it gives me a feeling perhaps of the people in Guantanamo with all these bright lights shining in my face. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can understand why they don't want to stay there very long. But uh, in any case, um, you asked a, a big question, Professor. Um, but you're right. There are, I would say, hellish places in, in the Middle East. I wouldn't say all of it is hell-like. Uh, and there are some places that are prospering and um, very much hoping to improve on their slot. But the Middle East, I think, for many years, has been the focus of 
a mode of, of uh, political and diplomatic management that is more concerned with uh, managing a crisis rather than resolving it. And if we look back just recently to the uh, Bush administration, which had the two-state solution, let's say, for the Middle East, the problem between Israel and Palestine, and the um, quartet was an American uh, initiative uh, on that issue. Um, we even had uh, a meeting in Annapolis in 2007 where all of the participants in that dispute gathered. Uh, and yet, there was nothing resolved. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, uh, the Obama administration, I think, also has been following in that line, uh, thinking that perhaps you can damp down the fires, but what is needed is putting out the fires. And if you look at Syria and Iraq, uh, still in conflict and, and in civil war, and nobody is willing to put their foot down. And it's not just the United States, I'm just saying the United States as an example. It's the world community. We were talking in the professor's office earlier, and I was saying, problem in Syria now, more than 200,000 people have been killed. One would think that when those figures, even much less figures, had been reached, that humanity as a whole would be concerned and would say, enough is enough. Let's put a stop to it. But nobody's coming forward to do that. And people are trying to take advantage. And it's as if scoring points in a tennis match rather than concluding uh, the match. And this, alas, I think works for other places in the area as well. If you take Yemen, if you take Libya, you know, it's, it's equally a view of, of managing a crisis rather than um, resolving it. Dan, how do you see? Thank you. Just both from the perspective of Israel, but also somebody that looks at the, at the whole region, yeah. Thank you, thank you for having us here. I'm delighted that the second year I'm doing this uh, great time at Harvard and I love the place, so it's a pleasure and to uh, Meet here, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Turkey Faisal is an honor as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I think that the Middle East is going through a major uh, political, historical revolution in a way. I think in the, uh, in the realm of, of uh, values, you have values competing here. Uh, there was an attempt that you could see in the Tahrir Square in Cairo, the people to try to get new, modern, less autocratic regimes. They were able to topple the regime down. And some people uh, around the world, maybe in the country that hosts us, thought that if you only remove the bad guy, I don't think he was that bad, Mr. Mubarak, in no time, a new Thomas Jefferson is going to be born on the Nile and build a new republic. It happened that this didn't occur, and what you saw is Forces that were subdued, unleashed out. Religious fanaticism, whether Shia or Sunnah, in every religion you have good people and bad people, very fanatic people, trying to bring religion as the paradigm to solve all the problems. Not alongside other things, but this is, you had it with the Muslim Brotherhood, his very motto, his very logo is uh, Islam will khal, Islam is the solution for every problem. As you don't need to learn to do other things in life alongside your religious uh, uh, beliefs. And then there were uh, the system that was built by the powers, the imperial powers, is shaking. You see the Middle East here in the map, you see part of it, the part that, as you say, is burning, or at least not quiet. And uh, I think that we don't see the end of it yet. What one needs to see, is to, if one can, to try to identify the sources of instability and threat, 
and on the other hand, the social stability uh, that can help stabilize and restrain those forces that really want to change the world in a dramatic and bloody way. Uh, without flattering, I think that Saudi Arabia and Israel are countries of stability and can do more together to help stability take its place. Uh, other sources, whether it's Iran with their ambition and uh, attempt to get nuclear and use terror in many groups, even in the Saudi Kingdom, some groups that are helped by them, Shiite groups. If you see the, what's been called here ISIS or Daesh or the, 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 the Islamic State, is not a challenge, a regular channel, it's a challenge to the whole system. So in cases like this, I think forces that want more stability and want to resolve things in a peaceful way should join hands. And if Americans will read the uh, area rightly, they may understand even better, can I say it more politely, what, what needs to be done. One has to remember the use of force, uh, as America used force, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, I don't want to, to judge it, but did not yield results of stability. And it might have shown the limits of the power of America, not only the power itself. Uh, the feeling of weakness is not good. What do you do to build together the system? I think uh, it's not a lost case. You saw trends and counter trends in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood and then with the, uh, the General Sisi in the public. You saw Tunisia going a certain way with the Nahda and then trying to find a way which looks much better now with a very interesting constitution which I read combining the French ideas of liberté, égalité, fraternité with, with Muslim uh, tradition, very interesting. We are not at the end of the storm, we are still in the eye of the storm. And one needs to find a way that, that forces uh, Jordan, Egypt, I think the countries we have peace with, and Saudi Arabia should be, I think, to take a role in others, to see that we work together, not only against terror, which is important and things are done sometimes, but in a broader sense. And the Palestinian issue, which uh, is something we need to resolve, you don't, can't see it, it's so small there, uh, needs to be resolved. It's not the source of everything, but it needs to be resolved alongside other things. We'll come to that later, I believe. Sure. Let me stay with the, with the big picture here for a second, Doug. We had the good fortune to have uh, my old professor, Henry Kissinger, here two weeks ago. Henry's f completed a new book at age 91 called World Order, which is an extremely good read. And he goes around the world and explains basically what's required to have order. And in every chapter, basically it, uh, the, it doesn't quite say this, but it would, the message is, you know, if you left it to me, I could make the order work pretty successfully there. Except in one chapter, the chapter on the Middle East, which is rather pessimistic. And basically he says, uh, uh, well, looking at the Middle East, trying to think about where are we going forward, maybe the Middle East is caught in a confrontation akin to, but even broader than, Europe's pre-Westphalian wars of religion. The Thirty Year War, which before it was finished, had succeeded in killing about a third of all the people that lived in Germany at the time. And then he even goes on and says, yeah, but maybe this is even more like the religious reformation, which was a century of turmoil in, in Europe. So if you're looking at the scene today, which looks pretty complicated, is this like uh, the high water mark or is this early in a long story? And uh, if Henry doesn't have any thoughts <laughs> about what to do, uh, how about the rest of us? Maybe, maybe one of you. Well, I would venture to say that Mr. Kissinger had his chance to do things in the Middle East. <laughs> and um, he was more successful than others, I would say, but also did not finish the job. And I remember in 1973, that was the year that I started working for the government. It started in September and the Ramadan war 
we call it the October War or Yom Kippur. And it started a month after I, I began my work. And sure enough, it was due to American intervention that there was a ceasefire. And subsequently, negotiations for what they were then called the disengagement talks, mm -hmm. which was to separate the military forces along the Suez Canal between Egypt and Israel and on the Golan Heights between Syria and, and Israel. But Mr. Kissinger devised what was then called the step-by-step -step approach. And I think if he had thought of it more in terms of a comprehensive package for that particular issue which was based on Palestine and occupied territories by Israel in 1967, I think most of the things that we're facing now would not have occurred. Um, Daesh, and by the way, for those of you who speak Arabic, uh, I call it Fahish, <laughs> <laughs> not Daesh. Fahish in Arabic means the worst of the worst, basically. And I don't think we should call it the Islamic State at all, but simply, really, just Fahish. So please, if there are any journalists here or any historians or anybody who has a media influence, keep repeating that word. <laughs> they just fish. Don't fish. 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 They fish. don't deserve anything yeah, to do with Islam <laughs> or with a state or with, uh, with Iraq or Syria. Fahish is, is a symptom. It is not the disease. In present list states, as also in um, Professor Allison's office, we, he referred to that when Al-Qaeda was decimated, if you remember in Afghanistan and then subsequently in Iraq, it didn't end there. Fahish came up. So unless you cure the disease, which is there now, you're going to have more fah Fahishes coming up in the future. And the cure is apparent, at least to me. In Iraq, there is an attempt at a cure now with a national unity government that will include all the sects and the religions and the various subdivisions of Iraqi society. But it was 10 years after Mr. Maliki had practically brought down Iraq. So the 10 years that were wasted when we in the area were telling our friends everywhere, this man is not good for Iraq. He has to be changed. And then, finally, after so much suffering in Iraq, we have this national unity government. Hopefully, it will be able, with support from the rest of the world, to meet the challenge of Fahish in Iraq. But you have another issue in Syria, equally devastating to Syria. 200,000 people killed. Everything in Syria has been practically destroyed. And yet, this man, Bashar al-Assad, clings to power, and the world lets him. The Russians give him arms, the Iranians send him troops and give him money, and America and Europe and other countries in the world simply turn their eye to what he's doing and concentrate on killing Fahish. Fix Damascus and you can eliminate Fahish. Get a national unity government in Damascus and you will see how they can challenge these absolutely awful people who want not just to kill but they want to dominate everybody. And this is, I think, where everybody should be going when you ask for solutions. Yeah. The Arab League proposition two years ago to the United Nations talked about an interim government with full authority in Syria that will have leave in place the institutions of government but bring to trial those who are responsible for the killings. Unfortunately, the Russians and the Chinese vetoed that. The Arab League didn't stop there. We took it to the General Assembly just to get a moral um, support for it, and we did. 135 countries voted for it. Nothing happened. Then we had the American and Russian proposal 
of um, Geneva I and Geneva II. It also talks about an interim government. Mm -hmm. But nothing happened. Why? Because nobody is willing to put their foot on the ground. So we, they leave us in limbo. Dan? Uh, uh, we just heard, I think, a very clear explanation of parts of the problem that we are facing. And I, I, I think we should try to find out what to do. It's not easy, but uh, analyzing it would not uh, be enough, of course. And I think there are two sources of instability. I'll say something about both ones. His Royal Highness just spoke of the role of Iran in Syria. Iran directly, uh, with the Al-Quds force, with Mr. Qasem Soleimani and others, with Hezbollah as the agents, are helping Mr. Assad to stay in power, killing people for him, being killed. They are Lebanese. They are not Syrians. But they uh, evoke the Shiite uh, alliance. Uh, and Iran, in Iran is continuing to destabilize the, the region. And the Fahish is the right way. Fahish that we spoke of is another source of danger. And one needs to find a way to cope with these two dangers. If one wants to have the world, so to speak, one speaks of world, one thinks of this country, America, take more active role, something dramatic should happen to show them that uh, it's serious. It's not a, a simple story to contain the ambitions of Iran. Now 24th of November is approaching. The, the agreement will or will not be signed. If, crazy idea, uh, it is very important, I think, for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and it is important for Israel and to many countries in the area, that Iran does not become a dominating power. Just think of a meeting that would take place between uh, the King of Saudi Arabia and the Prime Minister of Israel saying, we together call you the world, do something. We are getting our hands together, do something. I think even this country may be shattered and do something. If uh, we want to fight the, uh, and I think we should, the uh, terror groups that use in vain and in, in a very ugly way the name of religion and God to, to promote uh, their ideas, whether they believe in it or not, it's not important to me. We need to cooperate in a very deep sense, not only intelligence-wise, but otherwise, to show the alternative. Now, in the end, some decisions that need to be taken by leaders in this country, including my country, a call for leadership. The Israeli-Palestinian uh, story that was mentioned here is an issue that is with us since day one, since I was born, or before. I was still born under the British mandate over Palestine, I have to say, but it's there, and we need to resolve it. It's tough to resolve it, but the belief of some people that leaving it unresolved is possible is a mistake. It takes leadership. It's not easy. And leadership is something that many countries in the region have in shortage. Uh, so I think what is called for now is more cooperation, some dramatic action to show the uh, necessity of uh, harnessing the powers of the world, economic, even military threat, although military is always the last thing you want to do, needs, needs to be there. Otherwise, it, it, it won't work. And I think it, it can be done. I think countries, I, need, I see the cooperation we have with two countries we have signed an agreement of peace with both uh, the Republic of Egypt and the Kingdom of Jordan. And we have other connections with other countries, not on the table, under the table. Uh, we cannot solve everything. We are a small country. But I think we can add and help in that sense. I think the resolution, if possible, of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is of great help to us. And here I may differ somewhat. If, there, if we can't get a full resolution, the alternative is not sitting on our hands and doing nothing. I think we should start moving. And I think there are ways we may come to it later. Uh, may, maybe the Saudi initiative that was uh, proposed by the Saudi then prince, then King Abdullah in 2001, and was somewhat distorted in Beirut later by, uh, in January in Beirut, by Nabil Shah, who was sent by Asar Arafat to add the refugees inside and to make it a take it or leave it story. But basically, it was the most advanced Arab position ever proposed to us. I think we can uh, discuss it seriously. Can we have a, a conference, say in Amman, in Paris, the Saudi Israelis, showing that something has changed. The world is changing radically before our eyes. Uh, we need to do something different to show that things are changing, and we need to change. So it's a good question, Prince Turkey. Is this, is this the time for the 
Israeli Saudi or Saudi Israeli initiative? Well, Mr. Meridor mentioned um, Iran's nuclear ambitions and the Palestinian issue. And on the Palestinian issue, I will remind us all that the kingdom's efforts go back to 1981. Those are, who are yeah. old enough to remember with the Fahad Peace Initiative. King Fahad in 1981, for the first time after Camp David, managed between 1981 and 1982 to get full Arab support for an eight-point peace initiative with Israel that for the first time got all Arab countries to recognize that there is such a thing as the state of Israel. And before that, all the Arab states simply either called it the presumed state of Israel or simply didn't mention it at all. Yeah. And one, one of the, the, the interesting developments there was that that initiative was completely ignored, not only by America and others, but also more importantly by Israel. It was the, the one intended for that initiative. And then of course, as His Excellency mentioned in 2002, uh, King Abdullah's initiative equally when it came out with some distortions in the press, but it got a very negative view from, from Israel. And to talk now about Saudi-Israeli cooperation, when Saudi initiatives that would have, I think, been more than equitable in reaching a solution for the Palestinian and other occupied lands that still Israel occupies in Syria and in Lebanon. And to have ignored it, I mean, how can we work with a country like that? His Excellency says, let's do new things. I suggest, as I did in another conference like this, uh, to Ms. Zippy Libni, who was in charge, and I think she still is in charge, of negotiating now with the still, Palestinians. Yeah. Still, hmm? still now, we don't know. Everything changes now. Really? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> they say the government before. What hour at a This time. hour she's still in charge. <laughs> yeah. We were at a conference like this, and she was on the podium with the Araqat uh, 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 and, and uh, uh, the U.S. representative on, on Mr. Kerry's team, um, Martin Indyk, Martin Indyk. Indyk um, and the moderator, and they're talking about it. And, and at the end, you know, I asked Zippy Libni, I said, Ms. Libni, uh, Ms. Zippy Libni, why don't you accept the Arab Peace Initiative? She gave me a very convoluted answer you know, about how you, know, you can't expect you know, people to do this and that, and you have to consider this and that. I said, just say yes. That's all it takes. Then you can put whatever conditions, but get us sitting together. The Arab Peace Initiative talks about not only 22 Arab countries, but also 56 Muslim countries. <laughs> <laughs> engaging with Israel in peace and development and getting over the hang-ups. That, I think, is, is more of, of, of a, a reasonable and, and a logical way to deal with the issue of Palestine and so on. Then but let me, let me pick it up just to the level. Go to slide three here for one second. Three, yeah. No, next. One. What do we see there? Here. Okay. Cartoons, so okay. now let's do geopolitics 101. <laughs> so this says, keep asking yourself, keep repeating, the enemy of my enemy <laughs> is who? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So now, again, if you were just a simple-minded person watching the Middle East today, you would notice that it's hard to find a, what, what in Texas they would say a dime's worth of difference between Israel and the kingdom on Iran. Am I missing something? I think the, the issue of Iran on the nuclear power, first of all, from the very beginning of negotiating between the P3, if you remember, um, Britain, 
France and, and Germany with Iran. This was going back to 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. Singling out Iran at that time and putting ahead of Iran and telling them, frankly, this is how the P3 did it. It's a carrot and stick approach we're having with you. If you come along with us, we'll give you the carrot. If you don't, you're gonna get the stick. And then, of course, added to that, President George W. Bush's axis of evil, which included Iran in it. A more equitable view of all of this is what was agreed to by the MPT Review Conference in 2010 for establishing a zone free of weapons of mass destruction where everybody in the Middle East will be put on no nuclear weapons, no chemical weapons, no biological weapons, and whatever agreements occur there. Now, in two weeks, as you said, sir, there is going to be an agreement between Iran and, and the United States and, and P5 plus one, or not. If there is an agreement, it will allow, inevitably, nuclear enrichment for Iran. At whatever level you may think, call it 5%, call it 2%, but the process and the knowledge and the techniques will be available to Iran to do that. Immediately, I can tell you from this podium, without being in government, and I don't speak for my government, not only Saudi Arabia, but countries in the Middle East and outside the Middle East are going to demand to have the same opportunity to enrich uranium to whatever level is allowed to Iran. Where is there a stoppage of nuclear proliferation in that? You're going to have the technique spread worldwide. So isn't it better that we work toward a more conclusive end to proliferation by having a full agreement between all the countries? Two interesting factors that I keep my, my mind on. One is that although Israel is not a signatory to, to the MPT, yet Israel managed to attend at least two, if not more, sessions dealing with the zone free of, weapon, uh, free of weapons of mass destruction. To me, that is a positive sign from Israel. It's reassuring. But we need more, and not just from Israel. Because who scuttled that conference? It was supposed to be held in, in 2012, in December, in Helsinki, Finland. Two weeks before, the United States declared on its own that there was not enough preparation for the conference and that there should not be a conference. But I still don't want to stay in the weeds. Dan, if, if a Martian were looking at this, he might imagine that Israel and the kingdom are secret allies, at least with respect to Iran. What would, what would he I, be missing? Uh, well, I, I humbly tend to agree with your uh, <laughs> description. I would only say that if one needed any more proof the gravity of the situation and the gravity of what may unfold if Iran, in the eyes of the, of the players in the region, becomes a nuclear, or, or almost nuclear power, what they will do. Think of proliferation in the Middle East. There's in some countries, there's no shortage of money to buy uh, whatever is needed. I don't want to mention names of countries, but you may think of some. You can hardly think of any, yes. Well, they think of some, not one, by the way, yes. several. I, I, yes. I'm serious about that. And the technology now is available on the internet. Once you had to go to Harvard or to MIT, can I mention MIT here? My wife had a yes. talk there, okay. Of course. Uh, and other places, and, and it's dangerous. In an unruly world where you have so many ambitions that uh, people have direct line to Almighty, knows what he wants and acts for him. And if they have, if they get the, this potential, it's dangerous. And I think need, things need to be done now. And the cooperation that, uh, you have mentioned is of great importance. It cannot resolve all. You need all the forces that can act here. Uh, I think that negotiations with Iran is a right approach. Always negotiate. Smile. If he smiles, smile back. But alongside negotiations, you need to continue the pressure. The economic pressure on Iran led them to change at least the rhetoric, maybe some behavior, not good enough yet. 
And the option that was on the table, I don't, I'm the last one to push people to war, but the option needs to be there. If, if one thinks that America is weak, and this is what one hears from some people in Iran, uh, and if, if people don't understand, it will change, not in the Middle East, it will change the standing of America in the world, if it happens. It's a different world. And one needs to understand how important it is. This is why I call for something that is dramatic, like Saudi Arabia, Israeli, yeah. and other Jordanian, Egyptian initiative now. And I, I would say that uh, the, I think Israel should come with preparedness to rethink many things, because we need to see how we advance, see the new threats and opportunities that develop here. And uh, uh, the only addition I would have, and I started it earlier, with the Palestinians, it's tough. Now, Mr. Abbas, Dr. Mahmoud Abbas, doctor from Moscow University, uh, can he uh, speak for Hamas in Gaza? Do they accept? But suppose we agree with him. Can he impose it on Gaza? I, I leave the question open. I'm not going to, to dwell on it later. So I don't think we can wait. I think Israel should start doing things. I said it publicly in Israel. Maybe that's why I'm here, not in the government now, and it's fine. I'm happy with that. Great to be here. I think Israel can do certain things and refrain from doing certain things. Now, I know the settlement policy should be a limit, do it only in the areas that would become, as was mentioned, swapped, not other places. You can move uh, much of the authority to the Palestinians. Don't be their police, let them do it, willy-nilly. You can start to, to describe a line and work towards it. The thing that we can do, uh, and to change the reality on the ground, I think it's important. It may not solve all the problems at once, you know, uh, it's not very popular to mention Prime Minister Olmert these days. He has other problems. But, but he offered to Abbas in 2008 what I read in Condi Wright's Condoleezza Wright book. It's a very comprehensive offer. And, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't picked up by, by Abbas, as did Barak with uh, Yasser Arafat at Ken David. I was there. So it's not, I, I'm not saying there is no possibility. There may be a possibility. I don't want to say they don't want. I would negotiate with, on everything. But I don't wait. I think we need to move and try to create a better atmosphere for cooperation in the area against the real threats. The extreme Islamic uh, fanatics, extreme. I mean, most people who are Islam believers are people like you and me. But those who take guns into their hands, they want to turn the world upside down and rule it by, by uh, Khalifat, it's a crazy thing. It's dangerous, it's not worth it, it's dangerous. And Iran using it. So, and let me, so, so I let think me we need to do things and not only yeah. explain what they are. So. I'm going to stay with the theme of the emerging Israeli-Saudi alliance, if I were trying to be provocative. So with respect to Iran, I can't see much light between them. <coughs> with respect to actually uh, Israel-Palestine, if I listen to the conversation, I see a lot of commonality. But let's go to the slide uh, about ISIL, we call it sometimes, or I'm going to learn to call it. Fahash. 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 Okay. So uh, a group that was uh, uh, called by President Obama in January, a JV team, has now taken control of an area that's bigger than the state of Indiana. So this is everything inside the line there. Uh, its acronym, ISIL, that's its name, is the Islamic State of Iraq and Le the Levant. Sham, uh, and by Levant, yeah. it paints on its map Israel off the map. Well, so we it literally we are erases it. We are part of the Israel. Sham, Sham You're part of this. Lebanon, Syria, this, Israel all together. Their, in their map, Israel yeah. appears on their map. Okay. No, we don't appear. Then no, no, we don't appear at all. You disappear <laughs> yeah, on their map. Okay. Right. In the case of Saudi, uh, uh, Fahash's idea <laughs> that their Islamic caliphate is, is an existential threat to the kingdom's custodianship of the two holy mosques, as the Fahash people say quite explicitly. So how about from each of your own perspective, what threat does Fahash pose to the kingdom or to, to Israel. And if, if, if an existential threat to both, I go back to my cartoon and I'm thinking, well, here's another item, which it looks to me like 
there's an alignment of interest. So Dan, what do you think? Uh, you know, sometimes people take uh, arms into their hands and try to, to uh, turn the world upside down. I think uh, my distinguished friend here on the right uh, did right when he used whatever he, he had to use years ago when some people wanted to take over the, the holy place in Mecca. It was almost a revolution there. Uh, and I read about it, in, not in our intelligence, but in books, published books. And they say that you had a very important role to play there and, and put things in quiet again. It wasn't easy. It could have changed the whole Middle East, the whole Muslim world in no time. So sometimes you need to use force, forgive me for the ugly word, as was used here, to, to stop these guys. They, tr they pose a threat of a different, uh, for, to Israel of a different kind. When you have, for years, states fighting states, kings fighting kings, you know, in the old, from biblical times to no times, they are a paradigm of war. What do you do to, to, how do you defend, how do you attack? What are the rules of war? When you have what they call non-state actors, non-states, take Syria, which is now chaos. Suppose somebody from this uh, group, or another group, Nusra, whatever, launches a rocket on us. Who do you respond to? The Syrian army, they didn't do it. The, this group, how do you know who this group is? It's really, it's a collapse of a system. So of course it's dangerous. The old way was maybe sometimes stuff, but you had rules. A country, a kingdom, Saudi Arabia, Israel, the United States, have an, uh, a, 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 the international law said you have to take care of your own territory, make sure that you don't take <coughs> other people. They collapse the system. So it's, it's much deeper and broader than a technical issue. So I think the, the uh, cooperation that can be uh, implemented and even broadened in intelligence collection is of great importance. The world today calls for and allows for much more intelligence cooperation between interested parties. And I think there's a lot of common interest in several countries, not, not just one. But I, I say more than this. The people on the, uh, in the square in Cairo, Damascus, or, or in any other country needs to see that there is a hope, that there is another axis, not of evil, axis of people who are stable, normal, may not agree on everything, but want to stabilize the world and let them live ordinary life. And I think on this, some countries, I mentioned some of them, and you mentioned two, I, but the others can do something if they take the risks. It's a political risk, not easy for some Arab countries to do it with Israel. For us, uh, us and Tanya will tell you what risk it has to take for this. But, uh, but see the, the alternative. It's much too risky. So we need to do something dramatic to, to re-align to, to re, uh, uh, the Middle East uh, facing these two threats and using the opportunities to bring in more stability more cooperation, more economic development, because this is a poor area and people deserve it. Fahish is dangerous. Anybody who is willing to throw himself with a suicide belt around him on top of a tank to explode the tank can do anything. And there is no way you can control that. Um, anyone walking through that door with that belt around him can take us all. Yani. So, it is dangerous, but it is not, I would say, an existential danger. Because as I said, you can find the cure for it. And non-state actors, historically, while they have been able, historically, to affect situations and change sometimes even borders, in the end, it was really the states that managed mm -hmm. to deal with them in the 70s, we all remember the Bader Meinhof group. We all remember the Red Brigades, we, you know, the Red Army in, in Japan and so on. They nearly turned Europe upside down. But in the end, those states got together and, and, and dealt with that situation. And I think Fahish is the same, as, as was dealt with, with, with Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia. The kingdom, alhamdulillah, managed to practically not eliminate, but at least forestall Al-Qaeda from doing any harm. And you've see, read, of course, about the arrests that we've had um, recently because of the attack on a Shia village in, in the Eastern Province. But to go back to the dramatic steps that Mr. Meridor calls for, I think there are dramatic steps that also Israel can do to help, not just the Arab Peace Initiative, and if Ms. Zipilibni had said yes, 
That would have been the most dramatic step for anybody at that time. But even on the nuclear issue, Israel insists it is not going to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East. When everybody knows, all of you here know, and of course Mr. Merido knows above everybody, they're there. Just take the step, join the MPT, open your nuclear facilities to inspection, as everybody is demanding Iran to do. That will be a dramatic step that will convince us in Saudi Arabia to say, aha, here are at least some people in Israel who have taken the necessary step to bring them in with us in our concerns. That is one thing. The other thing, and I think one should not leave this un, 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 unsaid or ignored, Mr. Meridor mentioned that Prime Minister Olmer offered Mahmoud Abbas in 2008 a solution. Mr. Olmer was leaving the premiership. He was already accused of corruption. He didn't have more than two months in his, in his stay at that time. And how could Mahmoud Abbas sign on something that this man was offering him at that late hour? Equally, Mr. Barak in the year 2000. And it wasn't, if I may add, it wasn't Mr. Barak who offered Yasser Arafat the solution. It was Mr. Clinton. Clinton came to Arafat and said, Barack told me this, and he, but it wasn't Barack who did it. And even then, Barack was going to lose the election to Mr. Sharon. So to blame Arafat and, and Abbas for not signing with the losing horse, I think is unfair. That doesn't absolve them from their mistakes and from their responsibility to think first of the people they're responsible for, the Palestinian people, and to have put them in the front lines in the Intifada after the Sharon walked in the, ho the Holy Mosque there in, in, in Jerusalem and suffer the killing that they suffered. I think that is a gross misuse, not only of government, but also of responsibility to your own people. And I'm not going to judge them. A higher authority um, is going to do that. Let, but me, let me let Dan make Let, let me yep. just finish on, on one other thing. The issue of, of, of Fahish equally, I think, affects us all, by the way. It's not just Saudi Arabia and Israel and, and Syria and, and Iraq. You've got Americans fighting there. Europeans have got Europeans fighting there. Two or three teenage girls from Florida flew to Germany to go to join Fahish. Where did those girls grow? They didn't grow up in Riyadh or Skaka mm -hmm. or <laughs> Tabuk. No, in Miami, Florida. How did they get sucked into this, you know, fulcrum of, 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 of deceit and, 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 and awful uh, action? That is the question that we all have to ask of ourselves before we ask the others to do it. So Dan, I'm going to let you make a comment, but let me explain to the audience. We've come now for the time for questions from the audience after Dan's comment. And there are two microphones here on the ground floor, and there are two microphones at the loge. Please line up, and right after Dan makes a comment on this last comment from Prince Turkey, we'll go to the audience. Dan? I, I hate to go to the past because it's tough to <laughs> agree about the past, and it's not necessary. Because everybody can have his own, what they call now in postmodern era, narrative. I have my narrative, you have your narrative, fine, let's live with that. I, that's how I never wanted the Palestinians to agree to my narrative. I don't want to agree to theirs. Let's live with that. We need to find a solution as to the future from now on. Not the past and the mustakbal, what comes now, the future. But I have to say something, when I don't want to blame uh, um, 
Abbas, Mahmoud Abbas. It's not, I'm not playing a blame game. I ask myself as an assessment, as a person who was very much involved in these matters for many years, is there a chance to get the agreement? Now, see the, the situation, and I don't take all my words, nor Abbas words, with all due respect. I read Condi Rice's book. I think she's objective. I don't think she has an ulterior motive here. I, not, I, this is the way I look at it. It's a very voluminous book, I have to admit, don't tell, I didn't read all of it. I read the 50 pages that relate to this. This is what I read. And I take care of the, the, the true account. I think of this, Mahmoud Abbas, all his life, fought for the Palestinian cause. Since he was a child or, or a youngster, 48 and, and on, right? And after difficulties, he gets an Israeli prime minister who says to him, you get a Palestinian state, end of occupation, more or less 100% of the land with 60% swaps, Dividing Jerusalem, some international regime, but no right of return, but 5,000 people. Now, I think, yes, Olmert is not uh, going to stay in power for many years, possibly. But let me ask in a very simple English, who cares? If he says yes, no, in no time, President of the United States and President of Russia and everybody, maybe even the Saudi king, will come and endorse it in Jerusalem, nobody can run away from it anymore. Whatever Olmert, maybe Olmert would have won the election, but this is a different story. So it's not a good explanation to what happened. He didn't take it because he had to give one thing. He had to give one small sentence, end of conflict. No more claims. It's not easy. After all, let's not forget, I don't, I don't play it down. The Munazam the, al-Tahrir, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, was not built to get the territories. It was before, mainly for 48, to say we forsake this. There is Israel, these borders that we agree about, 67 or changes, and that's the end of it. This is not as if this needs courage, Sadat courage, like King Hossein ibn Talal Ali Ahmed courage, and Menachem Begin and Rabin courage. Not everybody has this courage. And not everybody can believe Americans and Europeans and so on when they let Oslo go to pieces. So, you know, it's, it's not enough to have okay. Mr. Meridor and say that, yes, if if Abbas had agreed, I don't, then the Americans would no. have come in and the Russians and so no, on, no. and they would have I think supported. we need to act regardless. I don't want is, to yeah. wait for him to agree. I would, I would love him to agree. I, I had so many negotiations. I met him mm. years at my home with Abbas. And uh, he was at my home three hours, we sat together. I sat with him and with Arikat. There's no word within the chain, good words. <laughs> and most of what I said was in the press later, but never mind. I, I, I know that it's, it's fine. Yeah. We didn't get there. And to wait another year, another decade, another century for what? If there's no agreement, let's do what we can now. And let's this is, I think, forward. what we should do. Let's let this lady get, get into this. Please introduce yourself briefly. Brief question ends with a question mark. Um, thank you so much for a very informative decision, uh, discussion. My name is Asma. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. I have a question for uh, His Highness Prince al -Faisal. Uh My question has two parts. The part one is that uh, there's a lot of funding which is coming for Taliban in Afghanistan and in Pakistan from Gulf states and Saudi Kingdom itself. So what uh, actions are, um, are being taken by the kingdom to stop this from happening? And the other, uh, the second part of the question is that uh, we have seen a proxy war, uh, Arab versus Persia, played out in the region for decades now. How do you see that uh, going forward? Do you see an end to that anytime soon? Um, your first question, you wanted to see uh, stop what? The funding which is being uh, sent to Afghanistan and Pakistan for the Taliban from the Gulf state and the kingdom. The funding? Yes. What yeah. actions, uh, what steps are being taken by the government to stop that from happening? Well, the kingdom has, has literally stopped any contributions of funds by anybody to any group or institution or individual other than through official banking regulations, which have been devised not just by the kingdom, by the world community through the United Nations. I think it's called FATA. And it is a, a system whereby any money can be traced where it's going to make sure that it gets to its lawful recipient. One cannot control individuals who take money in their pockets and go to Switzerland and from there fly to Peshawar and from Peshawar go on to Fatah and, and other places uh, in, in Afghanistan and, and distribute the money. But with the 
excellent and, and getting even more excellent cooperation between countries on intelligence, even that is being curtailed, not just in Saudi Arabia, but I think by, by other countries. The kingdom proposed, and we're still waiting for that international counter-terrorism center to be put to work at the United Nations, which has received $200 million from the kingdom to set up the human capacity and the technical know-how to share intelligence between all other countries, but also to share know-how and skills. There are many countries in, in, in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East that don't have good human resources to, to do their intelligence sharing. So the kingdom wants other countries to participate in this center. I think that's one way of going at it. Your other question was about? It was basically about the proxy war which is being fought in the region for decades between uh -huh. Persia and Arab. How do you see that unfolding? I and mean, millions have lost their lives. It has an impact on a lot of people. So what do you think it'll, when do you think it'll end? There, there are two things that we can't change. One is history. And the other one is geography. Iran has been with us thousands of years. We continue to be with us. And that way, we talk to Iran. We have an embassy in Tehran, and they have an embassy in, in, in Riyadh. Our foreign minister met with their foreign minister at the United Nations. My expectation is, when they met at the United Nations, that each one of them gave to the other a list of the complaints that we have about each other. This is just a guess. I, am not, I was not privy to, to the talks. And each of, us said, each of them said to the other, OK, we'll look into them, and then we must get back and see how we can eliminate that. Saudi complaints about Iran are, first, interference in Arab affairs. You have Iran in, in Lebanon, you have Iran in, in Palestine, you have Iran in Syria, you have Iran in, in Iraq, you have Iran in Bahrain, you have Iran in, in, in Yemen, etc. That's one complaint. The other complaint, media. Look at all of the plethora of, of, of Iranian media beamed at our side of the Gulf. It's full of invective and, and, and all sorts of of, of uh, incitement for Shia communities to rise up against uh, governments in, in our side of the world. That's another complaint. Third complaint we have, Iran, is, is nuclear. One of your graduates from Harvard Kennedy School, I think, was former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kuwait, Mohammed Sabah. Right. I think his son is studying here as well. Um, he tells a story, and I don't think I'm, I'm doing him any, any injustice by repeating it because I've heard it from others as well. He was sent by the GCC to President Ahmadinejad in Iran in 2005, after the summit that took place in Kuwait, with a message to the Iranians saying, your nuclear program is not only an issue of, of nuclear weapons, but also an issue of ecology and an issue of danger of accidents happening. And you're working with the Russians who've had a bad accident in Chernobyl. The answer of Mr. Ahmadinejad to the, the foreign minister was, Mr. Minister, you have nothing to worry about. We're not using Russian technology, we're using Iranian technology. And the minister looked at him <laughs> and he said, if that is your position, there is nothing for us to talk about. So, that is another complaint that we have about Iran's nuclear uh, issues because they have kept things secret, as Israel has done, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> unfair, put it, unfair. Put it unfair. all on the ground, Good. you know, on the table, this, bear it out, and let everybody see it. And this, that's, that's all we ask for. This gentleman is next. Introduce yourself. Gentlemen, uh, my name is Frank Rumel. I'm an MPP student here at the Kennedy School. I uh, wanted to thank you both uh, for coming here. My question relates to Syria. Uh, you know, earlier we discussed how there have been 200,000 killed in Syria. We've got many refugees, internally displaced persons. Uh, and looking over the past couple of years, the most powerful forces outside of the Syrian government within the country have been either al-Nusra 
or since their break, uh, ISIS. Given that, and given that you've described ISIS as the worst of the worst, would it make sense for the United States, the West, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and others to support Bashar Assad in his efforts to control the country in order to end the war and prevent uh, ISIS or those allied with them from eventually taking power within the country? My answer to that is no. And I, I explain why. Because, as I said, because of the disease in Damascus, because of Assad's persecution of all Syrians, ISIS comes up and takes a place in, in, in the world. So if you empower Assad, you're merely, as a former, another former foreign minister, I don't think he graduated from, from here, uh, of, of the UK said in a conference like this, when somebody made that suggestion, he said, Assad is the best recruiting force for that, for Fahash. They point to him and thousands of people will come to them. So you'll be empowering the wrong man. Empower the people who are fighting Assad on one side and fighting Fahash on the other. These are the people you have to empower. What do you say, Dan? We are in a very fortunate position. I, I'll tell you a, a secret. From in the beginning of the uh, turmoil in Syria in 12, 2011, we had meetings. There was a group in, in Israel in the government that was called the Sextet, Quintet, Sextet, number of ministers <laughs> like a chamber music uh, orchestration. And we used to discuss these things uh, day and night, all sorts of issues. Uh, very interesting uh, discussion with the prime minister and the defense minister. And there was a question, what, what is our position? With what happened in Syria. ISIS was not there, Daesh or Fahesh was not yet there. What should we do? And I remember after discussing, is this good for us, that good for us? I remember saying or hearing from others that give others, uh, whatever we want to do, we can't do anything. If we help him, he's dead because the Jews help him, that's the worst. If we fight against him, uh, we help him by help fighting against him. Now he, uh, everybody will fight against the Jews with him. So we are in a very good position that whatever we think is not important, we can't do much. It's not like it in the Arab world. He, I don't want to go into the, in Syria. The, this Assad uh, regime, like his father before him, uh, representing a minority of Alawites, they taught my business, I'm not going into, go, to go into that, but they use force in an awfully brutal way. And let me speak as a human being. I mean, I'm a neighbor. I, I don't <laughs> see the atrocities I see them on television, but it's, it's un, um, who could have thought four years ago, 200,000 people, children, women, even men should be killed, by the way. Not only children, what is this? And nobody can win it in a way. I mean, he, he may rule, still rule the, what they call the Alawite part of, of, I don't want to go into the geographics, it's too big a map for this. But, but it, it's over in a way. They can't go back to what there was. So is there a way, did he really care? By the way, he may think that if he's out, the Alawites will be slaughtered. The whole thing is not that simple. But uh, I mean, he was a staunch enemy of ours. He did keep the border quiet because there was deterrence. Again, the role of Iran came in. Iran is using him. They try to build their power in their region historically. Now, I'm not going to go into that. I'm not, I'm not a Muslim. I don't want to go to give the Muslims uh, uh, advice as what to do in, in Sunni Shia, but I understand somewhat. To think that Iran will govern the world by using terror, incitement, the way it was just described, and by getting nuclear and had being hegemonic because of this. Some kind of will say, well, this is, uh, you can't win them, you can't beat them, join them. It's dangerous. It's very, it's very dangerous. So I think that Syria is, should be seen in that uh, broad context. And uh, we can't do much about it now, but we need to act now. I think we, SMU, all of us, we need to act now. You all saw here, you heard here, things that were said by both of us. We didn't plan anything in advance. We met just uh, half an hour ago. And there is a lot of convergence. We don't agree on everything, the differences. But we need to overcome the difficulty that is impeding us from creating a new Middle East in a good sense. We need it because other forces are acting, whether it's Assad and the, the Iranians and the, and the Shiite militants or the crazy uh, hysterical people in the, on, the, on the Fires or Daesh or, or Hezbollah or Hamas. With the, it's dangerous. It's, it's human's life. It's people in the end. So what needs to do and the leadership needs to, uh, to forget the past and forget other things and focus on the main things, how we stabilize the Middle East, how we allow the good forces in the end to win. Okay, we Thank have you. about seven minutes left, so short questions and short answers. And this gentleman in the loge, please. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, gentlemen. My name is Sabah, Ahmed Sabah. I'm a <laughs> there Harvard he is. Kennedy school. <laughs> <He's the son. laughs> My father did graduate, but not from here, from the university itself, economics department. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my question is for uh, Prince Turkey. Um, what is your assessment of uh, yesterday's GCC summit in Saudi Arabia? Um, in your opinion, will the GCC develop their own capabilities as a major uh, military force in the region? And finally, um, the impact of ISIS or Fahish, uh, will it be something to cooperate or conflict with Iran? So just your comments, please. First, I think thanks to the Kuwaiti efforts to bring the GCC countries together, finally, alhamdulillah, at the summit yesterday in Riyadh, they agreed to do that. And Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and um, uh, UAE, sent back their ambassadors to Qatar. It was a needless and useless and absolutely foolish effort on whoever it was part that brought us uh, uh, apart. And uh, thankfully, there are people like the Sheikh of Kuwait who takes a personal interest in keeping the GCC together that we are there. And I think the GCC will continue to develop. Developing military capability is an important issue for us, seeing as how developments have come about. For years, when I was in intelligence, and you know, I'm sure subsequently, etc. Armed suppliers, whether in the West or the East, perhaps for their own interest, kept a very careful measure of who gets what and when and how. So most of our countries, whether in Saudi Arabia or, or the, the GCC countries, fell within that framework wherever we bought our weapons. You know, when Americans sold us weapons, they didn't sell us their best weapons. Um, when our officers were trained in American colleges and so on, there were certain classes that they weren't allowed to go in, as others were not allowed to go in, that dealt with sensitive issues that America wanted to keep for, for itself. So for years, the GCC was not capable of undertaking the necessary steps militarily to meet threats like that. But circumstances force, them, force themselves on, on everybody. The, effort to liberate Kuwait from Iraqi occupation under Saddam Hussein forced America, if you like, to come clean on many of these weapons systems that they had kept back because there was a need to integrate Saudi, Qatari, Kuwaiti, Emirati, Bahraini, Omani, etc. And so the GCC countries benefited from that in terms of know-how better training, better equipment, more advanced uh, technologies, etc., etc. And now I think this new coalition that we have fighting ISIS is equally imposing on America to share more openly uh, what they have with the rest of the coalition. And that, I think, will give the GCC countries the ability to go forward and develop the capability to meet challenges like that. We will never be able to meet all the challenges by ourselves. I don't think any country can. The US itself can. We've seen that. So yes, I think there is an opportunity for the GCC to go forward. You had a third question as well. Just um, in terms of ISIS or Fahish, uh, their impact with Saudi, uh, will there be uh, cooperation or conflict there? With Iran. With, uh, with Iran, yes. Yeah. Well. Iran talks the good talk, but they don't walk the good walk. Now, they talk about fighting Fahish. I have not seen, either in Iraq or in, 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 in Syria, Iranian troops fighting Fahish. What I see in Syria, for example, is Iranian troops killing Syrian civilians. And in Iraq, the even the Shias, the Iran-supported militias that have been galvanized now to meet Fahish 
in, in, in Iraq, they've been going after the supposedly Arab Sunni tribes that everybody's trying to get to fight Fahish, and they've been going after them. So I, I see you know, a very strange situation where Iran says it is fighting Fahish, but it's not. And I see Fahish equally saying that one of their big aims is to fight Iran. But I haven't seen them strike any Iranian target. Right. And so this is a, a big question, and I think if there were any Iranian officials here, I think they should be asked about uh, whether they, Iran they, is serious Then we'll not. speak on their behalf. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> let me, I, I have, of course, no idea, but I, I think that uh, one needs to ask oneself, why should uh, Iran fight uh, Fahesh or ISIS? ISIS weakens the Sunni countries first, mm -hmm. not the Shia countries. They're after the Sunni countries. So I don't, I don't know, the Iranians don't consult me on anything, <laughs> not on this or anything else. For them it's not that bad that Sunni rulers are fighting with their own people. So I'm not sure there is a, objectively a, a, a way to cooperate. On, moreover, uh, let me give an advice to this host country. If America aligns itself with Iran, it, loses, it may not win ISIS, but it loses the Sunni world. That's going to be a big mistake. So this gentleman in the lounge. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, my name is Ibrahim. I'm a junior here at the college, studying economics. I'm not going to be a prime minister. <laughs> Given the U.S. has be a rich man, don't be a prime minister. <laughs> I no. hope we all hope so. Become a finance minister. Keep going. <laughs> Given the U.S. has certain interests in the region, call them X, call them Y, call them I, whatever they are. To what extent is the instability that we see today a result of the U.S.'s efforts to protect those interests? Whatever. What, what we see in Egypt, what we're seeing in Iran, what we're seeing in Syria. And these, this is a question for everyone, just a general idea. I want to hear your thoughts. I the, the, what was the question? So to what extent is like what's happening today and instability that we see today a result of the U.S.'s efforts to protect its interests in the region, regardless of what those to interests what extent, are? Yeah. To what extent have actions by the U.S. Mm -hmm. contributed I, well, to the mess that we see now? I, 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 didn't, I don't think that they, they, they have a significant contribution. I think the problems are much deeper than that. The American administration might have made mistakes. Along the way, all of us make mistakes. And there might have been mistakes in doing this or that. And I had my own criticism regarding these issues, but I think it goes deeper than that. You see a huge battle within the, uh, these countries, the, the, the map that you see here. America might have done better or worse, uh, but I don't think it starts from there. Uh, I said earlier, uh, Many countries in the world uh, love to ask America to help them and then shout Yankee go home and, and curse America. America cannot solve all the problems in the world. In fact, I'm not an American. I don't want America to solve my problems. But, but in fact, wh when you, uh, when America used, before President Obama, there was President Bush, the second. And he used force twice, very significantly. And I'm not criticizing it. And I was not against it. I have to say, he didn't ask me. And the end result is that America is not building a state in Iraq. ISIS is trying to build a state in Iraq now. So the force, without force, you may be dead. I may be dead without force. So in this world, you need to be strong. But force cannot solve everything. So, and by the way, force is not only military force. Can America and the other parts of the world help economically, help uh, ideologically, help culturally? I think maybe things can be done. But part of the, what we see here is in the modern world, where communication is open to everybody. Ideas flow, borders don't stop them. And people want something different from themselves. Some of it is nice. The whole world was with the people in the square in Cairo because they spoke wonderful slogans. But then the other forces that are deeper and somewhat darker are stronger. And unfortunately, if you don't use uh, intelligently your power, as, as uh, His Royal Highness said earlier, sometimes you need to do it. I mean. Uh, if you don't do it, they'll have Bahrain the way Bahrain was almost there, and the Saudis took some steps to say, yeah, hey, th there's a limit. Without, uh, we heard all the wonderful talk, but there's a limit. We need to take care of our interests. So uh, America cannot solve all the problems. America could help coalesce the world. On Iran, America and President Obama are the main players. Because if you don't want to use, to be in this binary position, go to war or acquiesce in nuclear Iran, 
need to have a sound and strong policy now. And America is the only one who can lead it. I think this is of great importance. If America is seen to, to be leaving the scene, I don't think it is, but if it's seen like that, it calls for others to step in and fill this vacuum. It's dangerous. Because after all, and again, I don't want to flatter, but I think that America stands for the values that I was born on, raised on, we believe in, of liberty, freedom. Uh, this is what America stands for. <coughs> and it cannot fight for everybody, but if America loses and goes home, so to speak, it's a much tougher world. So I have criticism on America, you have, we have, but after all, it's, it's the forces of, of good and the causes and the values that we want to see prevail in the end. So we're officially at our ending time, but what we're gonna do <coughs> is let this lady and this gentleman put your questions very briefly, and then maybe ask for one minute answers by our uh, panelists. So please. Hi, um, my name is Leanne Scrozzoni, and I teach English as a second language predominantly to Saudi nationals, so this is for His Royal Highness. Um, Saudi young people have the highest Twitter use in the entire world with 150 million tweets a month, and one of your clerics recently called social media absolute evil. As someone with experience with both the U.S. and your kingdom, do you encourage your college students to keep ties to the rest of the world through social media, even if it disagrees with the kingdom? So, well, so wait, we're going to get both questions. This gentleman. Thank you. My name is Amir Aitan. I'm a second year at HBS. I would like to ask about the Israel's negotiation strategy. That is, if you have one side that strongly believes that the other side broken into his house, killed his son, and locked him up in a basement, and the other side respond is, I cleared the kitchen, and let, let's look forward. Do you think that's like a good negotiation strategy for the state of Israel? Good, so you will answer the first, and you the second. Briefly, please. Well, whoever said it was evil and so on, I thought this is freedom of speech. I mean, you're speaking in a country where people can say even more awful things than that. So if they think the Twitter is evil, fine, let them think that. I don't think the king thinks Twitter is evil because Twitter, as you said, is spread all over Saudi Arabia. I don't use Twitter myself basically because I don't know how to. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, social media is good and bad. If you look Fahish, where is it getting its recruits from? Using social media. So is there a necessity to look at that and say something has to be done? I think there is. Like you do, you deal with pornography, like you deal with you know, criminal issues that are uh, being propagated on social media. So yes, I think media is not a tool that can be easily let you know, to, to take its course without question. I'm not the one to do it because I don't know how to use it. But I'm sure there are people uh, who can. Just on the issue of, of previously on, 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 on America. In America today, and I heard the figure and I may be wrong, there are 80,000 Saudi students spread all over. I think some of them are here. It's 300,000. No, <coughs> it's 80,000. It, the whole total program oh. Uh, is 300,000 maybe, but it's all over the world. Anyway, those students came to America because they believe they want to get their skills and know-how in America. They weren't forced to come to America. They choose to do it, and they apply to universities before they get the scholarship. So why are they coming here? It's not just to sit in Harvard or MIT or Cornell and so on, but they engage with Americans, and they learn and they teach just from that engagement. And more importantly, their parents are quite happy for them to come and finish their studies in, uh, in America. That shows you, to me, the value of America in our part of the world. Uh, any Yemenis here? Okay. Okay, my Yemeni friends, Yemen, they have a wonderful, a wonderful saying describing America, I think, and the rest of us. They say we are two bottoms in one jockey short. <laughs> Basically. Shall I say it in Arabic or it would be too, too vulgar? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the case. So if anybody thinks that America can pivot east or pivot west or go to the moon or go, Reality is reality. And we saw 
clash <coughs> with the execution of these Americans, mm -hmm. forcing the hand of American administration to come, to come up with a plan to deal with Fahash. One last word, Mr. Belfer. I had a good talk with you before I came here, and he had some even more sensitive questions than you guys did, posed to me. <laughs> But I invited him to come to Saudi Arabia to see for himself. And I hope he will. And if there's anybody here who would like to also to come to Saudi Arabia, please do. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you, you have to do things first. <laughs> Accept the Saudi peace plan and you can come. <laughs> Dan, you get the last word in and answer before, to before. How, what kind of a negotiating strategy <laughs> is this? Before I buy a ticket for Riyadh, I, uh, I'll try to answer the question. Uh, although I'd love to come if, when, I, when I do the things or when you do the things. All right. Uh, I, 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 no, I'm, I'm out of the government for a year and a half now because I have some critic, critical position on government. I don't want to do it abroad. It's something that I try to keep not doing. But I can say, to me, the problem is not the tactics. Tactics may be wrong or right. The problem to me is that the government needs to set a goal. I don't know what the goal is. What is the goal? What border do you want in the end? You want to one state. You want to say what the goal is and try to act there. So this is my problem. But I, let me say something after the, oh, this is the last question <coughs> that is, may not sound coherent with what we heard here. I think I mean, we, we live in a world where the, the, we take our information from television, from the social networks, from what happened yesterday and tomorrow will be Another day, not the Scarlet Horror, another day, something different. And we are very impressed. And we may sometimes lose, lose perspective. From the Israeli perspective, which I present here, which I live all my life, I see a very positive trend. For the last 66 years, we exist as a reborn state in that land, uh, starting from almost nothing in terms of money, people, uh, asymmetry. And we got to a place, I don't want to boast, of peace with formal peace with some Arab countries, informal agreements with other Arab countries, resolving issues, getting economies that is booming, uh, technology, science, and people that are relatively happy. Is that the end of the story? No. Troubles and problems, but all over the world is like this. What needs to be uh, done is to have leadership that is ready to take the risks necessary to continue marching on that road. We are not on a losing road. We are, I think, on a winning road, not only Israel. I think there's a lot of potential. The Middle East is so much backwards that there's a lot of potential to, to move up. When a country that is very much backward in terms of GDP per capita, of poverty of people, starts to see China. They move like, like uh, a, a, a cellar a train I took yesterday. Not, not like the, the small, the, 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 low, the, uh, the um, one that goes step by step. There's a lot of potential. One needs to try to rid oneself from the old paradigms and hatreds it's not easy. I, I, we are all with the same thing because the, the challenges and the opportunities are so great now ahead of us. And in that sense, the, the two countries that, uh, whose uh, citizens sit here, his Royal Highness and my, my humble me here, uh, I think we need to, and other people, and other, we need to take those steps to change the Middle East. It's not changing by the hand of God, with all due respect, not changing by the hand of people. See, countries and governments have a lot of power if they're ready to take some risk to, to move. <coughs> Others are working, and we need to work, and this uh, a meeting like this should not be, I mean, I'm not the government now, should be everyday meeting with the governments. What do we do economically, intelligence-wise, against the bad guys, for the good guys? Why don't you do it? This is what I think the message that we should carry from here. Another message you must hear is, with Israeli, Jewish money, and Arab brains, we can do quite a lot. <laughs> 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 So let me, let me say thank you on behalf of us who uh, live here at Harvard and the Kennedy School. This extraordinary evening, two quite remarkable individuals. Thank you for sharing so thank much you. wisdom. And let's say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. you were great.